sometimes people don't know even depression has a name, that what they're experiencing is depression. Perfectly hidden depression is the same. And perfectionism is the same. A lot of perfectionists don't think they're perfectionists because you know what they'll say? I never do anything perfectly because they're so hard on themselves. <laughs> People, when they're carrying a lot of shame, and especially if they are perfectionistic, what they tend to do is laugh it off. They laugh off painful emotion. They laugh off hmm. painful memories. Hello, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. This is Nishant, and welcome to the Nishant Gar Show. This is a podcast about helping you live a fulfilled life. The mission of the show is to spread mindfulness awareness, and my job on the show is to invite world-class experts to extract the practices, routines, and habits to help you live a fulfilled and abundant life. Have you ever wondered how to break free from the perfectionism, and how the perfectionism can lead to a hidden depression? My today's guest is Dr. Margaret Rutherford, and she will go deeper into explaining that. I usually read my guest intro, and for this special episode, I have a friend to make an introduction with Dr. Margaret. Dr. Margaret has been a psychologist in private practice for over 25 years. She began writing online in 2012 and was just narcissistic enough to believe that she might have something fresh or funny to say about she has learned. She has begun a podcast called The Self Work Podcast with Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Her new book, entitled Perfectly Hidden Depression, How to Break Free from the Perfectionism That Masks Your Depression, was launched in November of 2019. She has been researching and writing on this topic for five years, and she's passionate about the message that although depression can be heavily masked by perfectionism, its damage can still be devastating to that someone who's trying so hard to smile their way through growing loneliness and despair. She has written for HuffPost, Psychology Today, The Mighty, Psych Central, The Gottman Blog, Psychologies, Stigmafighters, The Good Men Project, and now please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Dr. Margaret. Dr. Margaret, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nishant. I'm delighted to be here. It's really fun to talk with you. I've been looking forward to it for several weeks. This is going to be an amazing conversation. I know we are going to go so deep into the studies of depression, into your mm. book, self-care, self-love, so many things. So I was that wondering, yeah, I was wondering if you could just start with how would your family describe what you do for a living? How would my family describe it? Well, my father-in-law, who was not all that psychologically oriented, used to say when he was alive, he would look at me and sort of shake his head and go, I can't believe people pay to talk to you. So <laughs> <laughs> he really couldn't believe what I did for a living. But my, my family, my son and my husband, I think know what a passion it is for me to be a therapist. Being a therapist was not my first profession. I was actually a professional singer in Dallas. Mm. And I wasn't very happy doing that. And so I had been in a lot of therapy and it had really helped me. So I, I got to do this wonderful thing, Nishan, in my life. I, I started out singing, which I also adored. It, the profession just wasn't good for me. And now I've been doing this second thing for a living, which I also adore because it asks people to find their courage and to risk and to be vulnerable and I get to, to be I get to be a guide or a consultant or a collaborator, however you want to look at it, to help them go in the direction that is healthy for them and is fulfilling and freeing. And that has has brought me incredible meaning and fulfillment in my life. Could you elaborate more on your professional singing? experience? My professional singing? Sure. Well, I thought I was going to be an opera star um, in college. <laughs> and so I studied and I sang opera. And then I happened to be led into the Aspen Music School. I was good enough to get in. And I really met real opera singers. <laughs> and so I remember one moment at the creek in, in, in Aspen, I sat there and I said, I'm just not as good as these people. So I might as well fess up and, and look into something else. 
So I was going to the University of Texas, uh, North Texas, to, in their master's program in music. And I had discovered jazz when I was at the Aspen Music School. And I was, so I was trying to untrain my very now well-trained opera voice into singing jazz. And I loved it. And then I happened to get into singing jingles or advertisements for TV and radio. And that was eight or nine hours a day in front of a microphone um, with eight or nine people in this small little room. And But it was really exciting. You had to get... Uh, you had to be a really good music reader and you had to read the music very quickly. And so it was very fast paced and the harmonies were so much fun to work out. But again, you had about five minutes to work them out. You had to be very precise. And so it was quite challenging. But what I didn't like about being a professional musician was that you never quite knew what the next week or the next month was going to bring financially or however. I, I was on the cusp of I was successful enough to make a living as a singer, but I certainly wouldn't say that I was one of the of Dallas's top nightclub singers or anything like that. And then I began volunteering at the Battered Women's Shelter in Dallas, and that's kind of where I found my second purpose in life. I loved being a musician because I thought, okay, I can take somewhere, if I sing a song, I can take someone for three or four minutes and help them feel better or have an experience that's emotional for them. And that may be kind of transformative, but then doing therapy is very much like that where you're also helping someone find something in themselves that has a lot of meaning and fulfillment for them. So I just transferred all that energy into being a therapist and much to my amazement got into a PhD program. I think I was a curiosity actually. And and so I went from literally, I think the Fairmont was the last hotel that I worked, where I worked in Dallas. And then nine years later, I was seeing my first patients as a, as a clinical wow. psychologist. So it took me a long time, but I didn't have a degree in psychology. So I had to go back and take a bunch of hours and, and, but I, I, I love it. I, I still have a full uh, complement of patients. I see about 30 people a week, probably. Now, with COVID, I do telehealth, but it's been uh, very gratifying and challenging for sure. And then I started podcasting. Well, no, I started blogging back eight years ago and then podcasting four years ago. So I've really extended the walls of my practice to so many people that um, want to learn more about what mental health treatment is all about. Let's come back to this your your profession of clinical psychology as a therapist. Sure. Well, I would love to ask you that, what did you learn from your musical experience that you have not shared with anybody in your life? <laughs> My musical experience. I I actually probably learned more on stage. I've done a good deal of theatrical productions and music theater. And then I did as a jingle singer because Really, being a jingle singer, you have to, you're, 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 there's so much focus on getting the music out, getting the recording done. It's a business. Now, singing in nightclubs was a little bit different. I had my own group, and we worked very hard to, again, create a musical experience for people that was very special and, and moving to them. But when I get on stage, I've been lucky enough to, for example, play Desiree in a little night music. And she sings Send in the Clowns. And I think that's probably the moment in my musical career that meant the very most to me because this, that song is extremely poignant. And the director, who was an amazing director, she's won all kinds of awards, actually helped me learn how to be vulnerable on stage. And it was in that production that I that I really began to lose a sense of being Margaret Robinson Rutherford and I was the character and, and a very mm. vulnerable rendition of myself in so doing. And so I, I, it, 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 when you have that kind of experience, you're there for the audience, but it is so transformative for yourself because you truly are in the body and mind and heart of someone else. And you have to have a lot of empathy. You have to 
you have to think about the character a lot. You have to be the character a lot. And that was just a incredibly meaningful. I, I played other roles that were great, but that role was something I will never forget. It was really the highlight of my musical career. What do you say that that experience of being performing on the stages have really helped you in working with patients in your therapy sessions? Well, I had a real funny experience. In fact, it was in that play. One of my patients, who was a little more shy and a little more withdrawn, she came to see that production. And at the end, my character kisses her longtime lover and, <laughs> and everything. And, and so, and she came in and she sat down and she looked very sad. And I said, well, and she said, I went to see the show. And I said, well, how did you like it? And she said, well, I can't see you anymore. And her eyes filled with tears. And I said, why not? And she said, you kissed another man on stage. <laughs> and I said, listen, when you kiss somebody else on stage, you're counting. You're just trying to not get sweat on each other. You're hot. <laughs> you, you're not kissing. You're, you're stage kissing. And so she sort of forgave me. But that was pretty funny. And I, I know that some people, when I first started uh, be, as, as a therapist, being in musical productions, I had to sort of weigh it out and think, well, now, wait a minute, do people want to see their therapist on stage? Because I did some kind of wacky roles and I did some out there roles. I did all kinds of things. And then I realized I don't want for my entire life to be a psychologist. I am also a musician. I'm also a mother. I'm also a wife. I'm a friend. I have other roles that I play in life. So I just kind of took a risk and said, well, maybe there are people, there will be people who don't want to see me because I'm one of those theater people. And that, that means I'm weird or you know, something. And yet I'm sure there are others who say, thank goodness she gets out of her office and does something she loves. And so I, I was in lots of productions. The last one I was in was Tommy. I played the mom. It was a wonderful role. Also, really, really difficult. And talk about having to pull out everything I knew about being a mom and, and display it on stage. So I've had some great, great roles. So earlier you mentioned that your patient was astonished about yeah. that you were performing on the stages. How did you help her to forgive yourself? <laughs> oh, she she laughed. She said, well, I was just kind of shocked. And, and I said, well, I, I, sh I, I didn't think to prepare you because literally I don't even think anything about it. And she kind of laughed and she said, well, I just... I didn't know how to feel about it. I said, no, don't worry. I still love my husband <laughs> very much. And so we went on. It really, it, she was just kind of having a reaction, I think. Okay. So how would you tell somebody to forgive others for their mistakes or any, any practices would you recommend to forgive others? Wow. What a question, Nishan. Well, I think how you forgive others is basically probably, well, it's predicated on how you forgive yourself. If you shame yourself a lot and have struggles of your own with self-forgiveness, then you may not know even the value of it and stay in anger and resentment, not only toward others, but toward yourself. And that I think the more you know and learn how to forgive yourself, then the more you want to give that gift to other people. It's probably been given to you. And that's how you've learned that it's such a, we all make mistakes. We all do things that we feel guilt about. But when you can't forgive yourself, it's more that you believe that that act, that mistake says something about you being a bad person. And that's about shame. So that's not necessarily something you, you don't want to shame other people because they have made a mistake. I mean, and, and truly, if, you, if it's something that you don't know how to do, then what the, therapy is certainly an avenue you can go to begin to have more compassion for yourself. Krista Neff has written a wonderful book called Self-Compassion, and it's, it's that kind of understanding that Dr. Brene Brown works, you know, talks a lot about in her own research. It's about really not seeing yourself as 
okay, well, I have these weaknesses, I have, I've made these mistakes, and therefore I must hide them. It's much more about those mistakes, those vulnerabilities don't define me any more than my strengths do. When I first moved to Fayetteville, I read the book, it was in 1992, and I was, had been living in Dallas, and I had just finished graduate school, and I literally didn't want to read a book. I mean, I, <laughs> the last thing after graduate school I wanted to do was read. But I saw Maya Angelou on, on Bill Clinton's confirmation as president, and so when he took his oath. And I was so struck by her, so I went to Barnes & Noble and thought, okay, I'm going to try to find her shortest book. <laughs> and she'd written a book called Wouldn't Take Nothing for My Journey Now, which was a, a collection of her essays. And so I bought that book. And it was really life-changing for me because I, by that time in my life, now I've been married 30 years now almost, but I had been divorced twice by the time I was 34. So I had a lot of things that I felt shame about and that I couldn't forgive myself for. I was really struggling. and. One of her essays in that book was so moving to me because she had, she talked about this one night where she had been at a New York nightclub and she had just been voted like New York writer of the week or writer of the month or something. I mean, she'd gotten some honor and she got absolutely wasted at that nightclub. <laughs> and she describes this time when she swaggered over to some group of men that were sitting at a table and she plopped herself down and slurred her words and all this stuff and and kept asking them almost demanding to know why no men were interested in her and she was just she was she she said something like and of course much more eloquently than I'm about to but she said it was one of those times that you wish you could change your name and move to Canada so but and she had written about it in this book and I put that essay down, Sean, and I thought, I'm not going to be ashamed of my mistakes. If, if Maya Angelou can tell this about herself, this openly and unapologetically, and just say, yes, this was a hard time for me, then I can say, yes, I had a decade that was really a hard time for me. And I made a lot of mistakes. I hurt myself. I hurt other people. But I have to accept that that's just as much a part of me as things that I don't mind other people that they know about me. Would you mind talking about your mistakes and what were you ashamed of at that point? Well, I don't know if you've ever been married, but getting a divorce, is, you know, it's a big failure. And not only had I had one, but I'd had two. And so those were the things that the, you know, the why I married the men I married, the how one was in a, an emotionally abusive and, and sometimes physically abusive relationship, one was not, one was just a downright mistake. And I, I had justified, I, I mean, I had done everything in the book that was, my poor therapist must have just been shaking their head and going, what is she doing? And, but gradually I learned and what helped was that I did get into graduate school and that I was beginning to figure out what my early triggers had been and some things in my childhood that had caused me to, or at least influenced me to make some of the choices I had made. And as I began to figure that stuff out, and then I began to hear from my colleagues in graduate school that I made sense and that they liked me and that, that they thought that I was smart. And I thought I began to think I was smart that all those things that were being screamed at me, literally, I began to question. And so, slowly but surely, I did divorce the second time during graduate school. And then a couple of years after that, well, I had married after that, again, again, he's still my husband. He calls himself my current husband. But I, yeah, for 30 years. But I began to lift that veil of shame that I had been living under and realized that it had a lot to do. I had panic disorder that had developed during that period of time where I had panic attacks. That started when I was about 26 or 27, very much tied to my shame, very much tired, tied to how badly I felt about myself. And so when I began to address some of that in a much more healthy fashion, that's when I 
I hope my own therapy got better. That's kind of when I was just sticking my toe in the water of being a therapist. And so I probably limped along with some of my first patients in trying to address my own growth in a much healthier way than it had been in the past. And I had some wonderful help. I had some I had some crummy therapists along the way, but I had two or three really, really good therapists who helped guide me and who really made a huge difference in my life. As a listener to this podcast, I'm thinking, how should I hire a good therapist for myself? What should I look for <laughs> in a good therapist? Well, I've done a lot of talking about that because people do, I mean, it's a very vulnerable thing to do to to talk with a therapist, but it doesn't have to be from the very beginning. You know, of course, I, I've written a book about perfectly hidden depression, and a lot of people don't want people to know that there's anything wrong with them, that they might be or something they're struggling with that they might be seeking a therapist for. So you, the best way to do it is to ask friends, to ask your primary care physician, to ask a lawyer, to ask your OBGYN, to ask maybe, but, but your friends are a, a great resource. And you'll probably be surprised how many of them have either have a brother or a sister or a parent or a friend who've been in therapy, even though they have not. And because we have reputations, we therapists, just like plumbers do and every other profession, lawyers, whatever, you, you, you build a reputation as a certain kind of uh, person and therapist. I'm, people tell me I'm very direct. I don't beat around the bush, as we'd say here in Arkansas. And so I'm not always right, but I will tell you what I think. I'm not sort of a quieter, reflective person. I'm a more action-oriented, solution-oriented kind of therapist. So at least if there is something you can do about it, we're going to look for it. But I also, you know, help people look at the why of how they're acting. So basically, you want to find someone that you feel a connection with. And almost from the very beginning, you want to feel as if they're really tuned into you, that they're listening to you, they're focused on you. You want to make sure their business practices are straightforward because it is a business relationship as well. So you want to sign a contract, you want to know about confidentiality, you don't want to know about how records are handled, and you want to know about billing and money and finances. So, you know, there's a lot to consider, but the, but the beauty of it is that there's no other relationship like it. You know, the, now a bad therapist might have their own agenda, but good therapists, really their only agenda is to help you gain the understanding or make the changes that you want to make. Their agenda is to help you. Their focus is you. It's not like I'm your sister or I'm your wife and changes that you make may affect my life. The changes my patients make don't affect my life, except maybe I'm happy for them and I celebrate with them, but I don't have an agenda about what they should or shouldn't do. Now, if there's danger involved, if there's self-destructiveness involved, yes, I begin to have an agenda and want to point out to them, hey, I think you're going in a self-destructive direction. But all in all, I don't have a personal agenda with them. So the therapeutic relationship is very, very different than anything else that you might experience in this yes. life. Awesome, and I would love to shift some gears here. So in your book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, How to Break Free, from the perfectionism that masks your depression, I want mm -hmm. to ask you, Dr. Margaret, was there any point in your life when you were wanting to be a perfectionist, if any instance comes to your mind? Well, yes, I've been very, very perfectionistic in my life. And in fact, that's where a lot of the shame came from, because I, I was falling far short of perfectionism. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And so... But um, my mother was very much a perfectionist. In fact, she had some obsessive compulsive tendencies throughout her life and a lot of anxiety. And so I learned, I absorbed a lot from her. So I don't think that I, I mean, I know I'm not as much of a perfectionist as she was, but I did struggle with it as far as judging myself very harshly and having a lot of shame. I, I talk a lot about, you know, there's healthy perfectionism, which is about sort of being very positive. You might feel guilty about things, but you don't feel shame about it. 
you are also very goal oriented, but you, if you make a mistake or you, you don't reach the goal, you, you, you term it as a learning experience. People with uh, more destruct. Not people, to interrupt you here. Could you sure. differentiate between guilt and shame for our listeners who may not be aware of that? Sure. Shame is a mistake that you make and you make the mistake. You, you tell yourself, I'm a terrible person because I did this. Guilt is I made a mistake. I'm a good person who made a mistake. So you don't make it mm. about yourself. Okay. Huge difference. So positive perfections use more guilt. They say, gosh, I made a mistake. I made an error. I need to apologize. I didn't make my goal. I, I need to learn from that. Whereas destructive perfectionism is much more goal-oriented, accomplishment-oriented. I must do this because if I don't, I, I prove to myself that I am a terrible person. Shame is just constantly talking to you in your head and saying things like, you know, you, you really, you don't have what it takes to do this. You'll never reach that goal. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You shouldn't be even trying this. And so, you, you, you know, you develop this sense of need and, and huge thirst for accomplishment. And you take a lot of responsibility. And so it can become something that's really very destructive because you're always trying to meet the expectations of others. And guess what? You don't have any control over what other people think of you anyway. So when you see your patients going through perfectionism, what steps do you recommend them to come out of this perfectionistic approach? Oh, okay. Well, now there's perfectionism and then there's what I call this syndrome of perfectly hidden depression. And I'm calling it that because it's my strong concern. And actually, there's a lot of research backing this up. that I have not done. I'm not a researcher, but I've read the research that there is a presentation of actual depression that doesn't look like classic depression. And it does look like someone with this perfect looking life. And underneath that persona, underneath that perfect looking life is real despair, real loneliness, real guilt or shame to the point where there are research articles now pointing out that people who have certain kinds of destructive perfectionism are far more likely to die by suicide than people mm -hmm. who have just positive perfectionism. And even though that can be also a strain, and I'm very concerned about these people, Nishant. I've had people write me about their sons and daughters who died by suicide, who had perfect looking lives in their teenage years and had been accepted to wonderful schools and had friends and were popular and were smart. And they kill themselves. And I've heard, I've heard about the same thing in adults, and I know it's true. I, 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 I've had hundreds of people reach out to me since writing about all this saying, yes, this is me. Yes, I either tried to die by suicide or I attempted and or I've thought about it a lot. And because the pressure is so great, I mean, if I had to do a perfect interview with you today, I would feel so pressured to do that. I don't that's not anything I have to do to myself as this interview is going to be what it is. And so, you know, some people will listen and go, Oh, that was really, really good. And some people may listen and go, Oh, well, you know, take it or leave it. And <laughs> I don't have any control over that. So I'm not trying to make this anything other than what it's going to be. But that's the, that's a far cry from what someone would just of perfectionism or who I think meets the criteria for the syndrome of perfectly hidden depression. A syndrome, by the way, is basically probably the most well-known syndrome is codependence. And basically it's a, it's a group of beliefs or behaviors that are found together, kind of like salt and pepper or red hair and freckles. You, if you find one, you're going to find the other one. And I came up with this these 10 traits of this syndrome, because what I wanted to try to do was give people everyday examples of what someone who is highly perfectionistic and destructively perfectionistic, the way they're going to be living their life. Because guess what? A lot of perfectionists don't think they're perfectionists because you know what they'll say? I never do anything perfectly because they're so hard on themselves. <laughs> so they don't even think of themselves as perfection because there is a shame because of the shame yes we yes. don't want to put out our work yes we don't want to do anything 
Exactly. So it is a very, it's a cycle of always having to prove one more time that you can be better than you were last week. You can, you can make more money for a nonprofit. You can work on something faster and better at work. You can earn this um, designation of, of, you know, I, I did an interview myself last week with someone, John Moe, who's talking about these professional basketball players who said, you know, when I make this team and that team and then the traveling team and then if I go pro and then I, you know, everything becomes this next thing you've got to achieve in order to feel good about yourself. Mm. That success doesn't lie in external things. It has to be inner success, inner work. If yes. As a listener, I'm thinking, I've, I've got this perfectionism. I accept that I have this perfectionism. Mm -hmm. What should I do now? What should I do from here, Dr. Margaret? Well, the first thing, I mean, uh, it's another, I mean, you can tell I'm a storyteller. New Harbinger <laughs> Publications was kind enough and, and to actually publish my book. But they, when I first sent the proposal to them, they said, this is great, Margaret, but you don't have any kind of strategies for healing. You just describe something. And I said, well, yeah. And they said, well, we're not going to buy the book unless you have a healing strategy and you have two weeks to write it. Two weeks, <laughs> two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, two weeks. So I came up with basically the stages that I have with everyone, and I just applied those stages to perfectionism. So the first stage is the stage of consciousness. You know, you, you're, you, you study and are an expert in mindfulness. That's basically, you use a lot of mindfulness. You have to become aware that a problem is a problem before you, you know, it, it you may have a lot of cycling moods and until someone calls it bipolar disorder, you don't know that it has a name. Sometimes people don't know even depression has a name, that what they're experiencing is depression. Perfectly hidden depression is the same and perfectionism is the same. Well, what so, are the mindfulness practices in this stage of feeling? Sure. Well, again, mindfulness, and I, I'm a a beginning student of mindfulness, okay? <laughs> I, I, I would never call myself an expert on mindfulness, not at all. But in order to really, especially for people who do not want to and are very uncomfortable, don't even know how to express emotional pain, being mindful and being able to be in a mindful state is the way to go because you have to get quiet and you have to detach from your emotions to a certain extent, you note them. And what can happen is when you do that, you can begin to understand and accept their presence and you can delve more deeply into them. So being mindful, you know, these people will tell you, oh, I'm just not a crier. I don't have anything to cry about. And yet if they become quiet, if they do a mindful, if they practice mindfulness, they will realize that they do have emotions. They're just very, very good at compartmentalizing them. It's, they've practiced for years and rigidly pushing them away. But when you're mindful and you're quiet, then you can recognize and allow them in. When you say quiet, does it mean any sort of meditation? Yes, I I don't talk about meditation as something I talk more about mindfulness because I think that uh, sadly meditation is still misunderstood by a lot of people and they think you know are you talking about becoming buddhist and of course that has nothing to do with it but I mean it's 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 helpful but it's not something you have to become to be mindful so it is more a word that I think is more accessible to most people to just become mindful. I, I went to a workshop many years ago that John Kabat-Zinn gave, mm -hmm. and it was on mindfulness and, and meditation, but we did more mindful exercises, actually. And by the, by the second day, I was so relaxed and so mindful that I remember getting in my car, and this was in another city in Arkansas from where I live, so I had to get back on the expressway to get home. And I had to pull over because I was so relaxed and mindful of being on the expressway. What was it? I couldn't drive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I stopped and got a Mountain Dew to rev myself up so that I could get home. Uh, I didn't realize how much being unmindful was part of my driving experience, being on the defensive. 
it was pretty funny actually so you, i think do you remember I, those mindful exercises you learned in that workshop he did the classic one about the raisin that he does all the time in his workshops or he does a lot i hear you know where you take a raisin and you study the raisin and you look at the raisin and you turn over and turn it over in your fingers and you feel the texture it's just this you know long appreciation and noticing of the raisin and then you smell it and then you put it in your mouth and and then you know so he had us do really classic things like that very beginner type things we did a walking meditation a singing uh, a walking mindfulness exercise a a um sitting mindful exercise and and so he was he was very inspiring and i learned a lot in that weekend about what it was not and then what it was and while doing homework before this interview i found one blog on your website sure an art of mindfulness art of mindfulness in catching shame and depression mm mm-hmm. how can we catch shame and depression through mindfulness what is there a process what does it look like yes you know people when they're sh- when they're carrying a lot of shame especially if they are perfectionistic what they tend to do is laugh it off they laugh off painful emotion they laugh off hmm. painful memories they laugh off common. memories that they that hold shame for them and or they don't even remember it as shameful uh, a man comes to mind who the reason why he'd come in well actually his wife he came in first with his wife because she was pretty unhappy in their marriage and he actually came back then as an individual because he said i don't know what it is about working with you but you seem to really tune in to me and so he felt comfortable and he was talking to me about well what the the actual what was the thing that was happening in his life is that he retired he was highly successful in his career and then he retired and he began just kind of becoming a slug and drinking way too much and beginning to gamble and doing things he'd never done. And I said, "Well, tell me about tell me about some of your memories." He started laughing. He said, "Oh, I had one of those mothers. She just hated me and she used to throw rocks at me and tell me that I'd never amount to anything." And he was just over there just guffawing. And I looked at him and I said, "You have grandchildren, right?" He goes, "Yeah." And I said, "So, if you threw a rock at your grandchild, would you think it was funny?" He said no, of course not. And I said so why are you laughing now? You were a child and your mother was throwing rocks at you and screaming at you and he looked at me. He said I've never thought about it and I said you're right. And so I just want you to be still, close your eyes, think about that little boy. Reach out to him in your mind. And what would you say to him? And he stopped. it's basically a mindfulness exercise and he stopped and he said i can see him and i said so what would you say to him and he said i'd say it's not your fault right so it's that quiet it's that mindfulness that Pause. people don't know how to do and sometimes they have to be guided and i'm sure there were a hundred other moments just like that and he got kind of tears in his eyes and he said i've never even considered that any of this was about that that childhood and i said well guess what somehow or another you proved you you came up with a strategy i'll prove my mother wrong and boy have you but as soon as you retired you don't know how to help that little boy anymore because you're not making money you're not being successful at something and so that little boy is still inside of you and needs to be heard and needs to you need to have compassion for him and he did this man did some wonderful work he stopped drinking he started doing yoga because his wife was a yoga instructor and he started doing yoga and he found things to do in his retirement but we we didn't work a long time together but he he made a lot of progress hmm so it's that being quiet it's that slowing your mind down enough slowing your need for accomplishment your the next thing you're going to do that you're going to be fantastic at doing 
slowing all that down, risking that, because that can feel very frightening for someone who's used to staying away from that stuff and allowing yourself to connect with your own vulnerability. Yes. I'm curious to ask you, since we are talking about childhood, I would love to ask you, what was your childhood look like between, let's say, the age of 10 and 15? Well, I had a little bit of an unusual childhood in that I, was, I wasn't physically well. I had had a very dangerous childhood illness when I was an infant where I nearly died, and then I was left with some neurological problems. So uh, one of those being that my hypothalamus didn't function correctly, and so my body temperature went up. And If I got hot outside, my body temperature did not know how to cool down. I also had migraines. I was on some pretty strong medicine to prevent me from having seizures. And so I had a more unusual childhood because I I wasn't allowed to exercise. I wasn't allowed to run around and do the playground thing. So I had to go home in the middle of school. And that's in fact, that's how I started being a musician because I played the piano and learned how to play the piano, which I loved. And Gradually, as I got older, I began to try to, oh, let me, see. There's, then there's another piece of this. I also grew up in the South in the 1950s and 60s and early 70s. And at that point, I was taught that I was supposed to be a, a wife and a mother. And I began realizing when I was a teenager that I wanted to be that because I wanted to do what my parents thought I should do. But there was a growing part of me that was somewhat disenchanted with that idea that that's, that was all I was supposed to be. Then I went to college and it wasn't until college that I really rebelled. So, but I still, Nishant, had this need to be what my parents had wanted me to be and what I had sort of absorbed that I needed to be. So there was a real inner struggle in me about what I was supposed to become. My rebellion was later, I think, in my lifetime because of my illness and because I was probably more enmeshed with my mother. I know I was more enmeshed with my mother than a lot of teenagers are. Would you say that sometimes depression can arise from the fact that our family, our parents want something else and we want something else? So there is this inner struggle inside of us. Sure. You know, I... I, there are a lot of parents who won't talk about, who won't allow painful emotion to be expressed by their children. They tell them to, you know, look on the, you have many blessings, don't cry. You're not allowed to be angry with me. You're not allowed to question what I'm telling you. And so there are a lot of very controlling parents. Of course, there are abusive parents and neglectful parents, but Often, they're, they're people who treat you like you're the, their parents who treat you like the star of your family, and that you learn that the only way you really get positive attention is through accomplishment. So that can be very difficult. But yes, of course, there, there are many people who decide on a certain course of action. They're trying to please their parents, and yet that really doesn't fit them very well. And they can just live their life for their parents instead of for themselves. And I think there's probably a good deal of perfectionists who are like that. I remember one instance, uh, that instance happened a long time ago. I was in a grocery store. This kid was crying and her mother kept telling her, stop crying, stop, stop, stop. She was crying. Her her daughter was crying and her mom kept saying, stop, stop. Mm -hmm. So I felt... She's that small daughter is being trained at this early stage. You, you don't have to show your emotions. You don't have to cry. You just have to be happy. You just have to look happy. Exactly. Exactly. That message wasn't given to me overtly, but it as a child, but I don't remember. We didn't hear anger in our family. I don't remember really ever being taught how to be angry assertively. I, my parents had, they loved one another, but they had a very 1950s kind of relationship where, (laughs) you know, uh, dad was the breadwinner and mom was the, she reared us and she was supposed to be the lovely hostess and she was supposed to be, you know, the perfect wife and mom and very thin and 
all that kind of thing. And so she struggled a lot with that. I know she did. In fact, she had a lot of anxiety about it. So, you know, when I rebelled in my 20, in college in my 20s, boy, did I ever rebel. And so that was, again, part of that whole influence that it was part of my childhood. Again, I, I take full responsibility for it myself. But so that 10 to 15 really wasn't as so oh, it wasn't as important in my life probably as it is in a lot of people's because I was I was Im- I was emotionally immature. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. And the reason I was asking is, in a lot of psychological books, a lot of psychiatric books, it is mentioned that our childhood experience shapes our adulthood. A mm-hmm. lot of our conditioning and programming is done sure. at a very early stage. And we have to unlearn and condition those beliefs, old belief systems to really live a truly happy, fulfilled life. Yes. I mean, you know, there's a whole chapter in the, well, there are two chapters in the book about, one is about really more of a cognitive behavioral uh, technique, which is about really going back and questioning the rules, both spoken and unspoken that you've absorbed in your childhood and really deciding now, does this rule, do I still want it to apply or is it? Is it not helpful? Is it a rule that really gets in my way of being who I want to be, who I enjoy being? And some of those rules do get in the way. In fact, I have this funny little story from my own, you know, my mother was, again, she always wanted you to look your best. And and so she taught me to curl my eyelashes. She told me that I looked sleepy if I didn't curl my eyelashes. (laughs) And so every day, for I don't know how long in my lifetime, I would curl my eyelashes not once but twice sometimes. And that you know, the the thing you curl your eyelashes with is just you poke your eye with it. It's really terrible. And so finally one day I had a toddler son who was running around. So this was in my forties. And I threw the darn thing away. I just said, I'm tired of this. If I look sleepy, I look sleepy. I look sleepy. And so I was like 42 and still living by that rule. And but I knew that in the next couple of days, people were going to offer me cups of coffee or, you know, have you not been sleeping or something, (laughs) you know, because that is how much I was conditioned by my mom. Well, nobody asked me if I needed coffee or nobody noticed, actually, that my eyelashes weren't curled. And I just had to laugh. It was one of those very tangible, practical ways of how you can how you can take a silly little rule and keep on living by it as if it's the gospel and realize when you I, I don't want this rule in my life it's really dumb and it doesn't apply to me anymore so that's kind of a ridiculous one but but they can go down from that into really much much deeper more problematic and much more complex issues than that and then the other chapter is called about the stage of connecting with emotions and it describes what's called a trauma timeline where you go back to all of the younger ages that you that seem important to do from you know 2 to 4 to 8 to 12 to 20 to 30 whatever it is and you thought you think about those things that you that happened to you or you did at that age that were, were positive things, but you also start writing down the things that were painful or that somehow influenced you in a negative way. And so you you begin to develop and create this timeline of your life and you can go back and you actually can begin to see patterns. If this hadn't happened to me when I was eight, I probably wouldn't have done this when I was 15. If this wasn't said to me, you know, when I was four, then I probably wouldn't have done this when I was 20. So, and then that can, that can be a very emotional experience. I I say in the book many times that this is too traumatic. If you have actual trauma in your life, then doing this by yourself is just not the best idea. Please go to a therapist to help you do this work. But it also can be very eye-opening about the patterns from your childhood and it's it's not that you're completely governed by that. You don't have to be. But when you don't see it, when you're not mindful of it, when you're not conscious of it, it can be governing you in ways that you can't even imagine. And you mentioned that writing about your emotions. So I think we can use the practice of journaling, just free yes. through journaling about thoughts and views every day, sometimes. I'm a huge believer in journaling. Journaling, um, just writing. I mean, it's free form writing, basically. and it's 
it's hard, especially at first, because you are seeing in black and white what is difficult and what your what your thoughts are, what your emotions are. You're allowing yourself to dial again, just see in black and white where you are, spiritual, emotionally, mentally. And it can be kind of shocking at first. Yeah, it can. If you're being honest with yourself. But then what it really helps you do is to begin to move through, you know, especially with people who obsess and ruminate. They tend to think about the same things over and over and over again every day. And with those kinds of people, if you're writing it down in your journaling and you find yourself writing the same thing you wrote last week or yesterday, you tend to want to say, well, now, what else do I feel about it? So it helps you begin to move through what your emotions are and what your uh, mental state is, where you get a better grasp on all of it rather than just parts of it. Yeah, that is so amazing. Journaling is so amazing. Yeah. I would would love to ask you, Dr. Margaret, do you have any life philosophy or any quote that you live your life by? Hmm. Well, gosh. I think one of the things that I value the most that I have learned the hard way and it has a lot to do with what we're talking about. And I think I even mentioned it a little bit ago. That I think that for many, many years, I thought shame was the same thing as a good conscience. And that in order to have a good conscience, I needed to remain very vigilant and very judgmental about myself for any kinds of mistakes I might make. And so it made me very self conscious. It made me not feel as joyous. And so what I've learned and what I try to teach is that I have my strengths and I have my vulnerabilities. I probably have some that I don't even realize I have. Maybe I have some strengths I don't realize I have, and maybe I realize there's some vulnerabilities I still haven't really seen. But neither one of those things defines me any more than the other. I had a a tapestry in my office. I don't have it there anymore. I can't, oh, I know it's in another office. But anyway, I used to have it in my office where I work all the time and I would have my patients look at it and I would say, what color do you see? What, what color is that tapestry? And they'd usually say, oh, it's a beautiful azure blue or there are a lot of rusts and coppers in it. And then I would say, so do you see the black thread in it? And they look again and say, yeah, sure, it's pretty predominant. It runs its way all through the tapestry. And I'd say, well, you know, why didn't you call the tapestry black? And they'd look at me and they'd say, because black's just a part of what it is. I'd say, right. And that's the same thing as shame, as vulnerability, as mistakes, as it it means that you're a human being. And so that the blackness, the mistakes, the whatever you feel guilt or shame about or embarrassment or humiliation, those things are all part of, of being of living life. And they don't define you. They don't make you into something that, you know, is all black. It's it's a combination. You are a combination. There was an old song, Carol King, you know, my life has been a tapestry of rich and royal hue. It and I loved that. And I didn't really know why I loved that song at the time. I mean, I didn't have the consciousness I have now. But knowing that, I just think you can be so much more giving to others because you don't judge them by very harsh standards. You're kind and you're generous with others. And you can be kind, compassionate, and generous with yourself. I really love how you explain all this thing. This is so amazing. And before I ask you my last question, Dr. Margaret, I would love to sure. ask you, where can our audience learn more about your work? Where can they find you online? Anything that you want to share? Sure, of course. Thank you. I have a website. It has the creative name of drmargaretrutherford.com. My podcast is the Self Work Podcast with Dr. Margaret Rutherford. That's S-E-L-F-W-O-R-K. And you can find that on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, I Spotify, Everywhere you listen to podcasts, I'm there, I hope. And I love doing that. It's it's a weekly podcast, and I just adore doing it. 
And then my book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, can be found. You can do Harbinger is selling it, but also it's on Amazon. It's on Bar- at Barnes & Noble. You can go to your local bookstore if you want to give them some some support and they can order it for you. I doubt, It's not a New York Times bestseller, although it's doing pretty well. It's been translated this far <laughs> It's been translated this far into seven different languages. So that is so awesome. Yeah, that's really exciting. Not every bestseller, not every New York Times bestseller is an amazing <laughs> book, by the way. Well, you know, uh, people ask me, is, is what you were you hoping? And of course my ego was my ego would have uh, gosh. I probably wouldn't have been able to live with myself for a couple of days after that. But, you know, basically I've always said what I care about the most is that this message gets out because these people who have perfect looking, perfect looking lives are slipping through the cracks of our mental health system. They will tell me they go to a therapist and the therapist says, well, you know, you just seem kind of tired or you worry a lot or, you know, you need to take a break. You need to get more sleep. And they're really depressed, but they don't know how to talk to you about it. So if you're aware as a mental health practitioner, that there's certain questions you should be asking. There are certain things you should be looking for. When you've got somebody who's almost too happy in front of you, and then you ask them about their childhood or something, anything traumatic ever happened to them, they kind of look at you and go, no, not really. I I only have blessings in my life. You can go, okay, this isn't just a positive person. There could be something really wrong with this. Just like the guy, you know, whose mother was throwing rocks at him, you have to ask other questions. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about this message. You know, I never really wanted to write a book, Nishant. I, I, I didn't have that as a purpose in my life. I, I didn't have any aspirations to be an author. And all of a sudden I wrote this post back in 2014 called The Perfectly Hidden Depression the perfectly hidden depressed person, are you one? Thinking about some of these people mm-hmm. that I treated and the post went viral and it was on the Huffington Post the next week and I got hundreds of emails from people and I thought, oh, well, let me go research this and I guess that's when I was led to write this book over several years period of time. And I have your book right in front of me right now and I would like to quote two lines from your book. When sure. your life looks perfect... When your life looks perfect, but you are silently falling apart. Well, Dr. Margaret, it was amazing talking to you. And what's the impact you you want to leave on this world? Well, that's an easy question, (laughs) Nishan. You know, I, I think the impact that I want to have is one that that my own that i've lived my life following my own counsel in some ways that and others that have are far wiser than i that i i'm i'm a learner and i will continue to be a learner hopefully i'm curious until the day i die and so i have tried to learn and tried to share what i have learned in my own words however, whatever that means to other people, you know, I had such a, I had an author as a patient and she would occasionally, when I was writing the book and she would occasionally ask me how the book was going. And I'd really hit a hard point because I just felt so incredibly vulnerable. And she looked at me at one time and she didn't really know, she kind of sensed where I was. And she looked at me and she said, remember, whatever you have to say, they've never heard it from you. And I looked at her and she left and that's when tears came to my eyes. And I thought, you know, I have to believe in myself enough that I I will reach whoever I'm supposed to reach with my words. And I'm just honored to be able to, to be in a position where I can say those things because whatever I have learned, I have learned from the people that I have worked with. And so I guess the impact I want to have is That if my words have meant something to you, then I'm honored by that. But then, you know, turn around and give that gift to someone else because it can be a wonderful gift to give. So powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Margaret. It was wonderful talking to you on the show. Thank you so much again. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to this podcast episode today. If you did enjoy this, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast or you can visit https colon slash slash nishangarg.me n-i-s-h-a-n-t-g-a-r-g dot me. You can also share this episode with your loved ones to help them live a fulfilled life. You are not alone in this journey. We all struggle in life. There is no shame in talking about it. I go through my highs and lows. I get depressed and these practices help me in living a resilient life. You can also do this. You got this. Don't judge yourself. You are doing the best you can. And thank you so much again. Thank you.